It's Friday, and a lot has changed since Sunday. Only five days ago, they were cheering Jesus on as king. The mood was bright, and it was hopeful. But today is Friday, and everything is about to change. Today's events begin with Jesus crying in a garden in the outskirts of the city. The reality of, of what is getting ready to happen begins to set in. He would be betrayed by one friend and abandoned by the rest. He would be dragged to the circus of a justice system in the middle of the night. And then he, an innocent man, would be sentenced to die a painful and agonizing death. Only five days ago, they were welcoming him as king. But today is different. Today they shall crucify him. And they mock him and crown him with a crown of thorns and let him die. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. 
I am innocent of the blood of this man, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus law and handed him over to be crucified. Please remember that when Jesus was betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he was taken by the temple guard back to Jerusalem. He stood trial before Annas, the high priest, rather quickly. And then they brought in, I believe, the father of Annas, a retired high priest, still very influential, a man called Caiaphas. And then the Sanhedrin, the Jewish legislature, met. And all three found Jesus guilty and sentenced him to death. This was all taking place during the middle of the night, which was, by the way, contrary to Jewish law. Then they took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate didn't want to go to uh, He remembered that uh, Herod was in town. Herod was the governor of Galilee. Jesus was from Galilee. So he sent Jesus to Herod to be judged. Herod was glad to see Jesus. He had heard about him. He mocked him and sent him back to Pilate. And Pilate again tried to get out of judging Jesus. Then he finally turned it over to the crowd. And the crowd shouted, crucify him, and Jesus was taken to the cross. I have to make you see Pilate's problem. You see, uh, the Roman government, which ruled that part of the world, would not tolerate rebellion. Pilate had already had two small rebellions against him. If a Roman governor suffered three, he was usually removed from office. And Pilate saw that this could be a rebellion, and he wanted no part of it. He wanted to be neutral. So he thinks that he sees a way out. They have this notorious prisoner named Barabbas. It was the custom that the governor should release a prisoner every year at Passover time, and so he thought, I'll give them a choice. Nobody's going to choose Barabbas. They'll let Jesus go. But it didn't work that way. By the way, Pilate wise sent him a message. You be careful with this guy, Jesus. He's innocent. I suffered a lot of things in a dream because of him. Did she have a warning from God? I believe that she probably did. But as we look at all this, we see in verses uh, well, 21 and 22 these words. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas answered, What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. And they shouted all the louder, Crucify. Well, Pilate did something that was customary in that age. He called for a basin of water. He washed his hands in front of the people, which was a sign that an Oriental judge used to say, hey, I'm not going to pass judgment on this. I'm not going to pass judgment at all. And so Pilate did that, and he simply said, I'm neutral. What are you going to do with Jesus? They said, crucify him. He said, why? What evil has he done? And uh, Pilate said, I am innocent of this man's blood. And get this. They shouted back, his blood be on us and on our truth. I will say that they got exactly what they asked. From that time on, Israel was in trouble. Israel ceased to be a nation. Israel ceased to have a temple. And yet the Jew has never lost his identity 
And at a time when my people said all over the world there would never be an Israel again, at a time when they were saying that, at a time when I was taught that in school, suddenly we woke up one time 70 years ago and we had a new nation. 70 years ago this May, we had a new nation. Israel. Yeah, they've been troublesome. But they're a nation, and God said it would happen, but His blood is still on them until they turn to Christ, and they will. And if you're not too old, you're going to live to see it. So at any rate, He washed His hands, and He said, You make the judgment. They chose a rat. Now here's the three words I heard from the preacher Jack Anderson. Description. Do. Deliver. All starting with the letter D. Barabbas. What was his description? What do we really know about him? Three things. First of all, the Bible says that he was a robber. What kind of a robber? I don't know, but it was kind of the thing to do to rob travelers in that day. We see that happening in the story of the Good Samaritan. Maybe that's the kind of robber he was. Second of all, he is described as a murderer. I want to take you to Luke 23, the uh, 19th verse. Luke 23, if I can find it. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. I don't know what kind of murder Barabbas had committed. We don't need to know. But this I know. This guy is bad. But there's one other thing mentioned about him in the Bible. Insurrection. He stirred up rebellion. He was a troublemaker. And of course, Pilate could not tolerate that. In John 19, I believe it is the 12th verse, uh, it says if you release this man, you are not Caesar Prince. That was what the Jewish religious leaders and elders said to Pilate when he wanted to be And so they were really saying, we'll start an insurrection. So we look at all of that, and that's the description. He was a robber, a murderer, and a troublemaker, an insurrection. What was he doing? That was the second word. Description and doom. His doom was to die for his sin. By the way, he deserved it. He had broken both Roman law and Jewish law, and there was no way that they could do away with the charges against him. But that third word was deliverance. What was his deliverance? Very simple. Jesus took his place. Barabbas was sentenced to die with two other thieves. He might have been the middle man on the cross between two other thieves if Jesus had not been his deliverer. Barabbas was evidently waiting. He expected to be crucified that day. And all of a sudden, some official walks in and says, you're free to go. There are no charges against you now. And what affected his relief? The crowd chose him over Jesus. So that's his description, his doom, and his deliverance. You say that's the end of the sermon? Huh. You know better than that. <laughs> we want to make an application. Let's apply it to ourselves. What is our description? Well, I'm going to say we're robbers, and you're going to say, hey, I never stole anything. Well, not very much, anyway. 
the dying are <laughs> Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned. Did you get that? All. Don't think you are exempt from that, brother and sister. That all covers you. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have sinned. God says so. And in Revelation 20, it says that if we do not have our names written in the book of life, we will be cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. This is the second death. We die once physically. If you're not forgiven, you die a second time. And that second death, well, I'm not going to try to describe it. But you want your names in the last book of life. That's the do. We look at all of that. What is our deliverance? Jesus took a place. He went to the cross and when he died on the cross, he paid the price for redemption. The word redeem means to be bought off the market. If you'd go out and buy all of the brothels off the market, you would say to have redeemed the brothels. You're not going to do that. But when it says we are redeemed, it means that because we have received Christ as Savior, He has bought us off the market. We belong to Him. That is our deliverance. And we have eternal right by the one reason. Because Christ paid the price on the cross. And we have accepted Him as Savior. And Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men under me. And you know full and well that there have been some time or times in your life when you have felt wrong. Maybe you have responded, and maybe you have not. And if you have not, you are still in rebellion. You are not under redemption. So when I read the story of the rest, it's a description. It's duty and his deliverance. I see myself and I see you. And where are you fitting in right now? I want to close with an old story we used to teach our kids in Sunday school 50 years ago. This is a story we used to tell to help them see redemption. A little boy received a model kit of a sailor. He put it together and he had his sailor. And he delighted it to taking it to a little pond in the park. Letting it sail across that pond. And one day when he was doing that, the wind died and he couldn't get it back to shore. He threw rocks in trying to create waves to wash it back. Didn't happen. He had to go home and think, I'll be down here the first thing in the morning, and my boat will be washed up on shore, and I'll pick it up. And he did go the first thing the next morning, but no boat. He didn't find it anywhere. He had made it. This was a great loss. But two or three days later, he went to the same pond, and there was his boat. Except an old man who said that. And he ran up to him and he said, Mr. where'd you find my boat? I'm glad to have my boat back. And the old man said, you can't prove this is your boat. I found it here. And if you want it, it will cost you a dollar. A lot of money for a little boy. He ran home and got it. He had a piggy bank. He ran back with his dollar, paid it, and got his boat. And he was hurt to say, Little boat, you're mine twice. First I made you, and then I bought you. That's just what God wants. First he made us. He bought us. Are you going to respond? I'm going to pray, and if Gus will come up here and extend the invitation. In Jesus' name, I come to you. 
And I pray that the simplicity of this sermon will be remembered and that the simplicity of the application will be remembered and that the Holy Spirit will work through it and that it will bear fruit. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Hey, if you're still watching, we just want to thank you for uh, coming by and just watching this message. And I just want to share real fast uh, the reason why Harvester uh, does this is because uh, we believe that uh, you know people need to hear about the Lord Jesus. Uh, it is our mission to lead people to find and follow Him. And so I just want to encourage you, if you have not received Jesus uh, in your life uh, ever, I just want you to listen to these words in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but, to, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So if you uh, have never received Jesus into your life, I, I encourage you, investigate. Take some time. This is the most important decision that you could ever make. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show you right here, at the bottom of the screen, just our website. You can always go to harvesterchristian.org and find out a little more about our church. And if you don't live locally, then I just invite you find a church that you call home that believes in the Bible as the Word of God and just start worshiping, start learning more about who our Lord is. Um, I hope you have a great day and uh, thanks for watching.